All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Amanda Lynn Patton, Tricycle's Associate Web Editor, and I'm pleased to be here with you today for Dharma and Emancipation Reflections on Juneteenth with Dr. Camila Majid. So my guest today is Dr. Camila Majid. So to give a little background, Dr. Majid is a mental health therapist, a clinical educator, researcher, and an internationally engaged consultant on building inclusivity and equity using meditative practices. As professor of social work at California State University, Monterey Bay, she teaches clinical practice to graduate students employing psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral, mindfulness, based and artistic approaches to well-being. And she's engaged her Buddhist practice for over 40 years, leading colloquia, workshops, retreats, and meditation sessions globally on Buddhism as it relates to experiencing wonder, humor, and insight through transforming oppressive patterns and deepening relationships. And Dr. Majid is also the author of numerous scholarly and secular articles, and she's a contributing author to Black and Buddhist, What Buddhism Can Teach Us About Race, Resilience, Transformation, and Freedom. And she also has a forthcoming book with Sounds True entitled Joyfully Just, Black Wisdom, and Buddhist Insights for Liberated Living. So welcome, Dr. Majid. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be in dialogue with you today and with all the tricycle readers and viewers and community and all those who watch. So I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation in particular. I know that sometimes people are like, well, what does the Dharma have to do with lots of things, right? And actually, the way I think about it is our practice of Buddhism really informs and elevates every aspect of our life and our capacity to engage well with all realities and all phenomena, including the reality of the ways that the residuals of slavery and colonialism impact us today, that the Dharma, our practice of Buddhism, can enlighten our path in divesting ourselves of the residuals of white supremacy and colonialism. So Juneteenth provides an opportune moment for us to really reflect on, well, what is the nature of uh, spiritual emancipation as it is connected to emancipation from injustice? And what ways does the legacy of the enslavement of people of African heritage in the United States impact the lives we live now? the life you live now, the life each person who watches this lives now is impacted by that, not just the lives of African heritage people. So it's really an opportunity for us to notice our interdependence and to notice that, you know, we are in community with whether our um, ancestors are descendants of those who were enslaved, if our ancestors were descendants, or if our ancestors were enslavers, or if we are immigrants to the country who were not either enslaved or enslavers, but are also impacted by the residuals of white supremacy as they impacted African heritage people in this country and impacted by the resistance of black people um, to enslavement as well. So I just think it's a rich opportunity for everyone to really kind of lean in and explore, you know, what does my liberation have to do with the liberation of black people and how is it informed by my practice of Buddhism? Yes, absolutely. Um, and we'll get further dive into all of those rich topics that you just mentioned. So to kick off our conversation, could you speak a little more about the history of Juneteenth and then specifically what's the significance of Juneteenth from the standpoint of the Dharma? Well, what I'll say about the um, significance of Juneteenth and why it was something that African heritage people celebrated is because despite the fact of the Emancipation Proclamation coming sooner than that, um, it was very common practice for enslavers to, number one, say that there was no Emancipation Proclamation and two, uh, threaten on pain of death and, and, and torture anyone who chose to act 
on what they had heard about the emancipation of all um, people who were formerly enslaved. And this is really, really a critical um, a critical piece because I think that a lot of the times people think that, you know, oh, you pass a law and then it's all done. But there was a, a, a serious um, and, you know, just profoundly life-threatening um, situation, situation facing any um, anyone who wanted to act on that um, emancipation in many of the states, especially um, Texas, where there were over like 250,000 people enslaved. So when the soldiers, the large contingent of African-American soldiers, the way the story is told, I, I think I shared with you an article by a descendant of one of the um, children who was, a, who was freed on Juneteenth, on the original Juneteenth, um, and in that article, in that Time Magazine article, I think it's Janelle Ross is the author, she talks about how the reason that the day is important to African-American people and is celebrated was because it was a point at which the violence of a white supremacy um, could not be legally enacted anywhere anymore. So that's that's why it's important. And you know, at least not in terms of enslaving people. Of course, violence continues to be enacted. It continues to be enacted against African heritage people today. But the violent um, force into bondage could not be enacted anymore. And that's why Black people have been celebrating it for so long. And so the significance of it being uh, a national holiday is that it allows everyone to notice that 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 happened, that even though the Emancipation Proclamation occurred, Black people were not allowed to be freed, right? That, that there was this, that I think it, what it shows us is that legislation doesn't create um, change, it doesn't create safety, right? That there, there have to be, and there are, it's an incremental process and there are other efforts. So that the reason that it's celebrated was because at least that piece moved forward in some of the regions where, um, you know, enslavers were simply not letting go. I mean, and we can look at the, the country in lots of ways and see how um, the ideals of enslavement and the ideals of white supremacy, the glorification of the Confederacy is still very much held on to in lots of places. You'll still see that flag. You still have, you know, these civil war reenactments where people are kind of, and, and you know, I lived in Virginia for a long time. You still have all of these highways, major highways and streets you know, kind of glorifying folks who really participated in, you know, in decades and decades of torturous enslavement of African heritage people and genocide of Native American indigenous people. So, you know, there's a way that this still grips us as a country. You know, if you go to Virginia, you'll be driving down some of the roads that are named after some of these um, folks, Lee Highway, and you know, and and so we are all still kind of immersed in a context that is informed by the Confederacy and the ideals of the Confederacy and the glorification of the Confederacy. So we together are immersed in the residuals of slavery. So it's it's kind of my invitation to folks is to kind of look up and notice that and say, you know, this is our shared world. And, you know, it doesn't change if we don't do anything about it. And, you know, when you take your children to Virginia, when you take your children to most states, honestly, there's, you know, to New York and, you know, look at, uh, you know, look at the Statue of Columbus and what's called Columbus Circle, like, are we, are we really talking about the fullness of our experience, right? Since Buddhism is about being awake and insightful and present and divesting ourselves of delusions, um, how much do we allow ourselves to be awake to the reality that we're immersed in and, and use our practice to transform that reality? Yes, yeah, I've lived in Charlottesville and Richmond, Virginia, and it is very much still with us today. Um, so if you look around, you will see the effects and the residuals of enslavement in this country. Absolutely. Um, so to connect it to Buddhism, which speaks a great deal about emancipation and liberation, can you speak to some of the parallels between Buddhism and Black wisdom traditions? That's a great idea. I mean, well, I think that one of one of the things that I'm writing about and talking about in my book, In Joyfully Just, is 
is the ways that Black people have really demonstrated transmuting suffering, right? Because the truth of Buddhism is that there's their suffering, um, and that there is a path to end suffering, and that you can experience freedom despite circumstances. So, you know, if you think about things like the emergence of blues, for example, the emergence of blues emerged during the enslavement of African heritage people. That's where that music comes from. So in this profound suffering, people were practicing self-transcendence, right? That it wasn't like part of the way that racism and white supremacy views African you know, stories and, you know, African heritage spirituals and African people singing in the fields of enslavement is, oh, you know, they um, they were cheerful or they didn't really realize how bad things were <laughs> or they were fine with it. You see, they're happy, you know, rather than saying, yeah, we're being tortured, we're in hell. So this is the time to drop into uh, spirituality and self-transcendence and recognize that uh, the unchainable aspect of ourselves and to engage with the unchainable aspect of ourselves. So that's that's just one of many examples where I think Black wisdom, Black teachers, Black, Black wisdom traditions contain a lot of insight for people to really be able to learn from. Like I think people view Black artistry and Black um, resistance protest as that that's entertainment or that's protest, and they don't see it as, that's wisdom, that's transmuting suffering, that's mm. transforming one's own life and the circumstances around us. So I think there's just a lot to be learned from that. Absolutely. I think the phrase transmuting suffering, like that really, that's very powerful. Um, and on the topic then of interdependence, which you've mentioned a few times, can you tell us more then about how the residual effects of enslavement of African heritage people, both in America and globally, compromises our experience of and insight into our interdependence? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the story of white supremacy is that it, you know, even the, I'll say the people who are kind of recognizing or, or arousing some compassion, you know, for fellow beings often think of it as, okay, well, white supremacy is bad for Black people, or maybe it's also bad for Latinx people and Indigenous people and Asian people, but it's not bad for us as white people, right? And that's the place where it just reflects a profound delusion, like all aspects of each of our lives are interdependent with, with one another's lives, right? And it's it's ignoring, number one, the ways that the labors of people who have been, who were enslaved have built literally many of the buildings and homes and towns and roads and railways that we are in right now and that we use every day. So there's just pr a profound um, absence of awareness of that, right? So part of the legacy of white supremacy is and, and of enslavement of Black people because the, the bodies of Black people were enslaved, but also there was this notion that Black people are not contributing everything. So that's the real deluded, bizarre aspect of it. It's like, you know, the entire wealth of the nation being built on, you know, this torturously extracted labor, and then this total invisibilization of people's contributions. They didn't do anything, right? So it's like, and, and in addition to, you know, obscuring inventions and, the, and, and so mm. much of it is coming to light now. But there's a way that we've all been robbed of insight by white supremacy, right? So if you don't know, you know, if all the famous in American inventors you can list are white, that's mm -hmm. white supremacy. That's not true. It's just the delusion of white supremacy. And it's the information that white supremacy has kept out of our awareness. And it's available. Because, but the other delusion that we have is that we don't need to know, but knowing makes us more awake and aware of the interdependent nature of our reality. So it's funny because I often have this kind of discourse around Black History Month as well, you know, having people wake up to interdependence with Blackness because with the contributions of Black people, because it's just knowing reality, right? Mm. And, being, and, and knowing reality helps you helps us let go of some of our delusions as well, right? Our delusions of separateness, um, the delusions about inferiority, let's face it, there's 
delusions about Black inferiority. Those delusions uh, exist amongst Black people. You know, those mm -hmm. delusions exist among people of all ethnicity because everyone learned anti-Blackness. Everyone. Um, there's a really good uh, book by uh, Jennifer Eberhardt, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt. She's a behavioral psychologist researcher out of Stanford, and her book is called Biased, B-I-A-S-E-D. And it's extensive research. She did eye tracking research. So it it's, examines what's in people's unconscious, right? And Buddhism is about surfacing, you know, pieces of our awareness that are out of our conscious view so that we can transform on a deeper level. So in this book, she's using these eye tracking in her research, she's doing eye tracking devices, using eye tracking devices. And she did this work with, with elementary school and middle school teachers. And she just put a device on them to track where their eyes went and asked the question, um, who are the troublemakers in the classroom? And everyone's eyes, the black teacher's eyes, the white teacher's eyes, the Asian teacher's eyes, the indigenous teacher's eyes, the Latinx, everyone's eyes just gravitated towards the black student. So we've absorbed this unconscious anti-blackness from white supremacy. And we don't know we think it. We don't know. We just find ourselves locking our doors when we see a group of Black teenagers, or, as opposed to we don't do that with other groups of teenagers. And, you know, there's lots and lots of just data in every realm of endeavor that really show us the ubiquitous nature of anti-Blackness from healthcare to education, you know, like from preschool, uh, young people are having higher suspension rates. And, you know, it, it's related to that bias. And of course, she duplicated the study with law enforcement. But what's really, really fascinating about Dr. Eberhardt's work is that she recognized that if she inserted friction, is, is how she describes it, but really just creating a space to pause that and to ask a question, like for uh, to, to query the assumption that it prevented, in the case of the police, it, it prevented um, unnecessary violence and stops and mm -hmm. people were stopped. So, so what I'm saying is that one of the ways that, because I don't think anybody looks at violence, certainly not any of the listeners who are attending this today, looks at violence against Black people and says, who cares? I think people care. However, people don't think that they have any agency. And that mm -hmm. is an illusion that Buddhism says we have tremendous potential. We have the capacity to express enlightenment, right? So what would it look like to engage our enlightenment um, in, in challenging our own anti-Blackness? Because that's how enslavement lives in us. It's in our own anti-Blackness. So how do we use our practice to excise that? And then from that, have some agency in the world around us, like be free to interrupt, mm -hmm. transform it everywhere we see it. Yes. And in the article you have written for Juneteenth, which will be linked with this recording for anyone interested in reading, you offer some reflections, some moments to pause and some practices for people to, you know, disrupt that narrative, that anti-Blackness and that legacy that lives in all of us today. So could you share how Juneteenth can be this portal to practice and what that practice might look like for people? Well, it's interesting. Um, on my practice, I, I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. It's the core practice of um, Anishin Buddhism, which is in the Mahayana Mahayana lineage. And Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is the invocation that um, is the title of the Lotus Sutra. And, the, and the, the loose translation of it is fusing your life with the law of cause and effect through sound, vibration, or action. So as I chant myself, as I, as I do this uh, mantra recitation, I envision or try to embody or even just ask myself the, the query, what is the enlightened response to the situation? What is the enlight what is the most enlightened way I can approach whatever is ahead of me in this day? And in my daily practice, I invite myself into making the world a more just place. Right. So how do I use my practice of wisdom and enlightenment to um 
improve, to clarify my own mind, deepen my insight, and also deepen my courage and, and courage to enact the capacity I actually have to have a positive impact on the world around me. And that is profoundly liberating because the thing is, you're not free. No one is free if you walk around in the world like, oh, well, it's awful. Nothing I can do. It's kind of the scared, disempowered place, you know, like, oh, you know, like that there's there's more than that for us. And I feel I know that with our practice of Buddhism, whichever tradition we practice, we can open up more insight and more courage that creates agency, right? The Buddha acted in the world. It's not just kind of sit on a tree and, oh, I'm feeling great, that's good enough, right? It's about trans transformative, um, engaged Buddhism. So actually I was thinking I would ask you, what's, if, if do you do you practice yourself? Because maybe I can do a tie-in like to, to like offer a more concrete example that relates to your practice. I do a lot of, body scan meditations and just grounding myself in the body and then through that to the earth and I remember we published an earth touching practice a while ago and that really stuck with me so for me just practices that ground me through the earth and then also through every other living thing then so I would say that is my practice. That's wonderful. Can I lead something that's kind of along that line? Can I offer something? I would love that. Okay. We're just winging it here. This was not prepared. I'm just really kind of feeling into the moment. And, and that's really the invitation that I'm offering um, all of the viewers, everyone who sees this. You don't have to kind of feel like it needs to be overly structured. Just like work with whatever practice you have and consider how you can incorporate liberation of all beings, you know, which includes, you know, eliminating your life and the world of, of, of the residuals of slavery, how can you work with it more regularly? So, because it's like a discipline, it's like a muscle, you know, and, the, and when you use it, you feel more empowered in the world and more free. So, okay, let's try a practice, you know, just Great. We'll sit in whatever position makes us feel you know, most grounded and comfortable, it's fine to close your eyes or drop your gaze if that helps you to just drop into your internal view. And yeah, let's just take a few deep diaphragmatic breaths together. Noticing that the breath itself is an expression of our interdependent reality. The air we breathe in is the air others have breathed out. The air we breathe out, others breathe in. And that the act of breathing and engaging with the air, letting it sustain us, reflects our interdependence with the earth itself, the trees and the seas that cultivate this perfect quality of oxygen so well calibrated to nurture our beings. So in the breath, we see our interdependence with nature and with one another. Maybe noticing the floor, the ground under your feet. Let your feet just tap the ground a little bit. And notice this perfect holding that the Earth and the universe is doing this ideal gravitational hold that keeps all our atoms, all our aspects of our being in perfect alignment. Notice that this is the ground that is common 
to us as human species, common to many species of life. The earth itself sustains our interdependence and reminds us of it. And we can let our awareness of the earth also grasp the ways that the environment, the earth itself, has been harmed by white supremacy, by enslavement. We're strong enough to hold that in our awareness as well. Our practice sustains our capacity to hold all of reality in our awareness. We can let our minds notice that the trees, beautiful trees that offer us so much oxygen and beauty, that they were used to torture, were and are used to torture especially African heritage people, through the massive use of lynching. So when we notice our trees, when we do our walks through our forest and notice the trees in the different parts of the country we live in, we can offer gratitude for the ways the trees sustain our lives and we can offer compassion for all the harm that was done to humans and to the trees. Through all the lynchings that are also part of the legacy of enslavement. We can allow our awareness to take in the cultivation of the land the cultivation of indigo plants, the cultivation of cotton plants, and the cultivation of soil itself, and consider for how many centuries that cultivation was done by people who were being tortured daily, sexually assaulted daily. And we can allow profound gratitude to arise for their labors and compassion to arise for these, our common human ancestors. As we allow compassion to arise for ourselves, all of their descendants. And just taking in a broad awareness allowing our bodies to notice. What does it feel like to notice? I'm connected. What happened to the bodies of enslaved people? What does it feel like for my body to notice it? To not push it away, to take it in. What do I feel in my body? What do I feel in my mind when I notice the exploitation and the abuse and the violence of black children, right? Because children were born enslaved for so many generations. What does my mind think the impact of that is on what I see and experience in the world now? What does my mind and body feel and think when I hear about the shootings of Black people, this consistent anti-Blackness that we have had in the country since enslavement? What does my heart say? Maybe practice putting a hand over the heart just for a moment.
Just noticing how does my mind respond? How does my mind engage this reality? How does my body engage it? How does my heart, my feelings, my affective self engage it? And then turning to our spirit, our vast spirits enriched by the Dharma. We practice this expansive, liberating, emancipatory teaching. How can I liberate myself from powerlessness if that's what arises for me? Fear if that's what arises for me. Shame if that's what arises for me. How do I liberate myself from these things? And noticing action, right? That sometimes liberation, Frederick Douglass talks about liberation proceeding from action, right? What action could I take to liberate myself from the paralysis of shame? What action? could I take to liberate myself from hopelessness? Allowing your Buddha nature to let a thought about what I could do arise. Do I need to learn more about the benefits and the ways that African heritage people have enriched my town, my professional discipline. Is that a way for me to release some of the shackles of white supremacy on my own insight? Do I need to, do I get to engage in liberation efforts or efforts to end violence against black people? Is that a portal? What action can I take towards our collective liberation. Practicing with these questions. We guide ourselves and one another free. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I'm suddenly back in this Zoom call, but I was not here a moment ago. Well, that's good because, you know, like it's it's so interesting that we started doing these, you know, contemplative practices over Zoom during COVID, you know. Mm -hmm. Had a wonderful opportunity to work with some colleagues at the, the Center for Mind and Brain and uh at UC Davis, we're studying, you know, contemplative practice during COVID, and we've been studying that together. And it's just, it's, it's just, it's just another portal, you know. And it's really good when we're not in Zoom in those meetings. Like you just put it so well that you're actually in practice, you know. So yeah, yeah, I, that's wonderful. I love doing this, and this is something that I, I'm, I'm delight. I, I. I'm delighted to say I get to do with a lot of organizations and universities. They're like, okay, yeah, we want to, we want to work with Black History Month or we want to work with, you know, um, Asian History Month. Can we do it? Like, can, can we get some help doing it in a contemplative way? Because it's, it's not always so useful to just kind of recite facts. We need to, we all humans, whether we're Buddhist or not, really get to practice and reflect in a way that, we connect to the meaning of it all for ourselves and for our lives. So thank you so much, Amanda. I knew that you would be up for the perfect person to do this with. <laughs> yeah, it's been so great working with you. Um, but I really loved what you said during the practice that, you know, there's space to hold all of these things in awareness. And I think that a lot of times people can get bogged down in just one part of that contemplation around suffering. Um, but no, there is there is space to hold all those things. And I was feeling that. Um, so that was really. 
Yeah. I yeah. Think that was a wonderful closing moment as well. Um, but is there any other topics you would like to go over? Is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, um, I will say that, um, you know, Black efforts, black, part of the Black wisdom tradition is the social justice leadership. Um, and I talk about that in the article too. So, you know, one of the ways that I, I feel like people can resource ourselves, right, so that we are buoyed in our efforts to face it, right, because you can't transmute suffering if you don't face it, right? So, we, we need to be buoyed though. We might need resource in facing it. And I really encourage folks to turn, to, of course, people can reach out to me and I'm happy to support. Um, and there are so, there is such a, a rich haggis, legacy of, you know, black wisdom and, and thought leaders around liberation, you know, from Franz Fanon to Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, and, you know what I mean? So it's to begin to read and engage with the works of people who were you know, transmuting um, suffering, like as they were experiencing the worst of it is I think one of the ways um, that we really, we really get to win. Um, you know, uh, Sojourner Truth has a really, so I, I will close with just a couple of quotes from, you know, folks that I really, uh, African heritage people who I really, really deeply admi admire. Um, Sojourner Truth says, life is a hard battle anyway. If we laugh and sing a little as we fight the good fight of freedom, it makes it all go easier. I will not allow my life's light to be determined by the darkness around me. So in that quote, she's really, you know, talking about, you know, that in our in our efforts, the, the point of Joyfully Just is I'm talking about how in the efforts to create more justice, we actually create more joy in our lives. And that's exactly what Sojourner is alluding to in that quote. And then, you know, there's a quote from Frederick Douglass where he says, there is no Negro problem. The problem is whether American people have loyalty enough honor enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution. So I love that quote because Frederick Douglass is saying that there's nothing that anyone needs to do for black people. We have figured out, you know, Juneteenth is, is in many ways a culmination of black resistance and, you know, black people ended slavery that Unfortunately, some of the discourse around the end of enslavement has centered white people, but that's just how white supremacy is just showing up there too. But, you know, Frederick Douglass is saying how there's this opportunity for us to really actualize the ideals of our constitution in this country and an opportunity. I, I, I extend that to say that there is an opportunity for us to actualize our enlightenment and that we can create an enlightened land as we um, create this enlightened realm within. So I'll, I'll close with those two quotes and with really my deep gratitude for the um, opportunity to, to be with you all today. Should I share um, how people can reach me or will that be available just on the, on the link? We can list it in the email as well, but yes, feel free to share now. Okay, well, my email is Majid, contemplative consulting at gmail.com. Um, that's just my last name in the words, contemplative consulting at gmail. And I'd be delighted uh, to hear from you. And I also have a, a newsletter that comes out just twice a year. So you're welcome to go to my website, camilamajid.com, and sign up if you'd like to stay updated on different workshops that I'm doing and um, just get connected. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. I, I I have to mention that what a joy it was to also work with you on the article about Wayne Shorter's life, and um, very excited that that's going to be in the print edition of Tricycle as well. So, so much beautiful work that Tricycle is doing, and I'm very happy to be able to support it. Thank you. So, thank you so much. Dr. Majid for joining us today and for this wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. So Tri School is really grateful to be able to host these types of events. 
and we are a nonprofit organization. So your support really makes a difference. To make a donation, you can visit tricycle.org slash donate. So thank you, and we hope to see you again soon.